Yeah. Okay. So I was a YouTuber, and I took the plunge, moved over to Twitch. Been on Twitch pretty much ever since. Obviously, the second channel has edits and everything, right? And there's that. But the first thing I did when I came over to Twitch was, you know what? I'm going to play my, one of my favorite things of all time. And one of my favorite things of all time is sorcery. It's one of the first, I think it is the first actual stream I did when I said I'm going to go like full time on Twitch. So, after crossing a million followers, we're going back in. We're going to start at part one. It's been like six or seven years. I like to actually play this game anyways every five years or so. Because the game is so fun and there's so much weird shit you can do. And if you don't know what sorcery is, listen to me. It's required reading for this stream. Let, let's go over required reading for German 985 for you to be a viewer. You have to have seen every Ernest movie twice. You have to be on record saying that Gremlins 2 is better than Gremlins 1. You have to have seen the first at least two Ghostbusters movies. You're gatekeeping. This is just, this is the way it is. You have to have beaten Glover for the Nintendo 64. That's a fake one. You have to have made at least one dirt house in Minecraft. And you got to go do sorcery. Or just watch this, right? You can just watch it. Let me just tell you something that I... The, the reason why I thought to do this, this didn't... This didn't kind of jump out after a million followers. I mean, I was thinking about what I wanted to do for a million followers. What the hell would I even do? I was probably not going to do anything. All right, so again, let's go over this again. Sorcery is uh, one of my favorite things of all time. It's a choose-your-own-adventure book that was turned into a game by this company called Inkle. I have a video on this game I from like seven years ago or whatever. I played this game on Twitch. You know the deal. We're back in it. For a million followers on Twitch. And if you don't know anything about this game, do you not have to look much up? Don't look anything up about it because we're going to do it again. Are you guys ready to get to do sorcery back to sorcery? I don't, I'm not seeing enough excitement in this chat room. I'm seeing a lot of, I'm seeing a lot of like, dude, just watch the Ernest movies. I'm not seeing enough excitement here to turn this on. I'm saying, dude, go watch Ernest Saves Christmas, like Pog. Like, why don't you just get the right, buy the rights to it? It can't be more than a few hundred grand. I, I don't know that I, I, that could be inaccurate. So don't, I don't know why you're saying that. That could, I don't know how much the rights are to the whole franchise. It's probably in like the fucking tens of millions. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time to begin. Steve Jackson's sorcery. <laughs> You have walked the wilds of Kakabad, through Kare and the spiteful backlands, all the way into Mampang. You've survived traps, thieves, serpents, and vengeful gods. And now it is here. The crown of kings! Let's go! Let's freaking go! It is said that the crown was never forged, only found by Kalana the Reformer a lowly foot soldier who became emperor of the Eastern world. Such is the power of the crown. The air around it crackles with influence. Okay, chat, so should I take it or should I wait? Should I take the crown or should I wait for a little bit? Take it. Your destiny awaits. With the crown in your hands, you will be as powerful as Kalana. The goblins are arming, the giants are waking and the birdmen carving cruel daggers from stone. War will come, but you will prevent it. Then, the image of the crown begins to flicker. You rush forward. It's a trap! And startle yourself awake. You are alone, exhausted, in a little hut in the outpost settlement. Your unimaginable journey is not even a single step Begun. <laughs> I'm so excited! Inkle presents. Sorcery! Yeah, I got no cam on. I figured cam off, right? Part one, the Shumatanti Hills. Are you ready to get obsessed with this? 
all of the people in the chat right now understand something. This is required reading. It is sunrise. You dress, breakfast on bread and goat's milk, and collect the pack and sword from beside your bed. Test the blade, pray for luck, or leave the hut. Uh, I'm going to test my blade. Okay. You pause to test the blade against your thumb. The blacksmith has done well. The edge is keen, and it draws a narrow line of blood. Outside the hut, you hear the outpost settlement stirring into life. So, praying in this game is interesting. You have a god that you pray to. Right now, it's the panther. It can change. And it will over the course of the uh, of the game, right? I don't want to use it because you can only use it once a day. By the way, you have health, you have money, and you have food. You need to be very careful with these. It's time to go. I don't want to. I don't want to pray. Time then to depart. You lift back the flap of the hut and step into the early morning sunshine. So as we continue, as we play, you're going to see flags are going to appear for places that we can go. It's not always as simple as going in a straight line. The outpost settlement. Eyes follow you as you leave the hut and walk towards the great Shumatanti Wall. The frontiers people of this tiny settlement are well aware of your mission. Greet them. Let's greet them. You turn. Oh, and we've got these amazing pictures. I forgot about this. The artwork is by uh, Ian Livingston, by the way. It's awesome. It's so interesting and, and, and scary. There's a lot of crazy artwork in this game. You turn to them and bow. Some smile in reply, but are too afraid to approach. Others make gestures of protection. You are going beyond the wall, so they believe you to be cursed. A man is waiting on the path to the Kantapani Gate, the final doorway between Annaland and the wilds of Kakabad. You recognize the sergeant of the Sight Master Warriors. He holds out his hand. Greeting, sergeant. Well, get out of my way. Wait, what? <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> there you go. You got it. You got it once. All right. Greetings, Sergeant. Greetings, Sergeant. He touches his forehead with two fingers. You are almost ready, he says. I have for you a gift from the king. Twenty-four gold pieces. It is all we can spare this time. He holds out a pouch. Take it, take half, or refuse it. I'm going to take the whole thing. Because I just I want it. You accept the gift graciously. Thank you. You should buy some supplies before you pass the wall, the sergeant says. And you must collect your spell book if you wish magic to aid you. Finally, should you wish to practice your sword play, I will go one last round with you. And he points with his staff towards the training ground. So, something that's interesting to note about this, uh, for those of you hardcore gamers, you can, I believe you can just not do this, and not be able to cast spells through the whole game. So, that's kind of, like, stupid. <laughs> See, like, you could just, one, one of the huts set slightly back from the others is decorated with glyphs and strange symbols. A terrible smell emanates from its doorway. This is the hut of the chief mage. He's been preparing your spell book for days, reading star charts to work out which spells will be available to you in the different locations in the hills and beyond. Go inside. I, I need the book. I ain't doing this without the book. You lift the flap and go inside. The mage looks up at you with haggard, sleepless eyes and presses the book into your hands. Do you understand how to use this? He asks. I do. I actually do, and I can tell you guys how to do it, but I do understand how to do it. Yes. The mage nods. Good. He scratches absently at his ear. Remember, some spells will cost you effort to use, but the ones that don't will not work without a focus. An item of some kind. You will need to read the book to know what. So, in sorcery, in almost every scenario, in almost every single scenario, It'll give you the opportunity to cast a spell. The spells range from zapping people, shooting fireballs out of your hands, floating, putting walls up, uh, controlling non-intelligent creatures, making them stupid. 
yeah, there, there's a ton of stuff you can do. I don't know how Steve Jackson sat here and came up with all these potential scenarios to write out and have different ways to go. But some of them, you need actual materials, right? You need, for instance, gob, summons a goblin. And some really, really fun, funny shit can happen. We, you guys know that you've seen it before. Where's sus? Let's find it. Come on, let's get nostalgic here. Where is it? There it is. This is sus. This is sense danger. This is not somebody being suspicious. This is where that comes from on this channel. You know why? Because I would cast this fucking spell every five minutes because I was terrified of everything. I would be like, boom, look to the stars and be like, sense danger. What? what what's wrong? Maybe cast on the caster suspects a trap and it will indicate tel telepathically to the caster if the danger and the best protective action. If already trapped, this spell may be used to minimize the effect in certain cases. This is sus. This is what it is. It's not the sus guy. I know it has two meanings for you all. This is just tutorial stuff. We have to go to the training grounds. We're gonna, I'm going to explain how fighting works because, yes, you fight in this game. There's battling. There's, it's like a fighting system. There's combat. Get excited. So how this works is you can either defend and take one damage or try to overpower the other person. It's simply a numbers game, right? So let's say I decided to defend. I will always take one damage no matter what if I get hit. All right, so yeah, so if, if I defend right here and he attacks, right? We both defended, so nothing happens. It's pretty much like a rock, paper, scissors almost. The Sightmaster is a powerful enemy. By defending, you will receive the minimum damage from any attack he makes. The Sightmaster Sergeant defends himself as well. The round is a stalemate. I will now defend myself. Whatever attack you play will damage me, but a strong attack will use up more power. Choose a weak attack. So again, if I swing with one power and he defends, he's going to take one damage. If I swing with nine power and he defends, he still takes one damage. So you always want and if, to... And if he attacks and I attack at the same time, it's just based on who has the, the higher number of power to the decimal. That's who takes the damage. So he's going to... He's, he said he's going to defend... I'm going to give him a little swing. It's going to do one damage. It'll always do one damage. All right, my next attack is going to be weak. You will be able to overpower me by playing a stronger attack, but be sure your attack is stronger. Right? It has to be stronger. So if I do four, he did 1.8. Bingo. You took two damage now. So what happens is when I swing for four, I lose four on the bar for the next turn. That's how it works. All right, my next attack's going to be medium strength, but you will be able to overpower me. So let's go for it. Let's do the whole thing. And there he goes. This is... Oh my god, my head! Oh my god, my fucking brain! <laughs> oh my god, my fucking head. That went into my brain. The earwig exploded. You play a strong attack. There he goes. All right, enough training. I'm ready to do it. Here we go. You shake your head. Very good, the sergeant agrees, but if you wish about in earnest, then I warn you, I will not go easy on you. He indicates the wider yard where there is a space for a true match. All right, time to go to the gate. You reach the foot of the mighty gate. It is sealed. The sergeant places one hand on the wood. The gate has been locked for some time to deter raiders, he tells you. But you will have no difficulty. The stars in this place allow the dot spell to be crafted. And he stands back. It's time to cast our first spell. So. Again, the way this works. So you have to spell out a spell. And in any scenario with a spell. You get potentially a few options. Five options. Two options. Ten options sometimes. It really depends. So what I have available to me right now is these letters first, right? You have to, it's a three letter word. So I could, I could zap the door, but this is gonna take three health and it's gonna be a, a disaster, okay? This is gonna be a fucking disaster. Like, let me just be honest with you. There's also, I could do hot, probably. Hot is throw a fireball. I'm probably gonna kill somebody. Did I, I don't, I don't, I don't think I've ever done this before. Yeah, I know, all right, I'm gonna throw a fireball at the fucking door. You cast the spell winding a fireball around your palms, then you release it at the door. The great wooden gate explodes in a flash of light. The Sightmaster laughs grimly. 
<laughs> we will have to rebuild that before the goblins raid us. But I am pleased to see you have power. <laughs> Fucking waste of time. By the way, that was three health. I think Dop is one. Together you step into the wreckage of the gate. One last word, he declares. When you have the crown, find the highest point you can find. We will be watching. Watching from where? From here. The Sightmaster warriors are selected from birth for their incredible powers of telescopic vision. You do not know how far he can see. This path leads to Cantapani, settlement of traders, though most are rogues and thieves. You should be there before the sun has reached its peak. From there, three routes lead on to Cristatanti, but no single route is safe. Kakabad is a land of devils. Enough talking. It's time to go. Striding away, you pass through the gate. The faces of the folk watching your departure reveal the hopes that the rest on your... Uh, I'm a terrible actor! The faces of the folk watching your departure reveal the hopes that rest on you and your quest. The early morning air is crisp, and the rising sun paints the slopes in shades of peaceful beauty, concealing the evil that lies ahead. The path winds through slopes of wild scrubland, the countryside is deserted, and the eerie silence is broken only by the cawing of the occasional crow. The birds appear to pause in the air to examine you as they pass. They make you uneasy, as if you were an intruder in their presence. Barely an hour beyond the wall, and the air begins to grow foul. The Shumatanti hills are infested with the pestilence of the Baklans. It saps the energy from your body, leaving you feeling nauseous and weak. Cover my mouth. You cover your mouth with your neck scarf, but it does no good. They warned you of this. You will grow accustomed to it the longer you are here, but for the moment you must be very careful. Your maximum stamina has just decreased. You can see your stamina at the top of the screen. If it reaches zero, you die. Stamina can be regained up to maximum by eating rations or resting. But yes, you die. This is how you die. And... Tons of things will kill you in this game. This is not safe. Alright, the first real choice of the game, we're gonna, let's take a look. We can take the road to Cantapani, but we can cross up through this Cantapani gate area and head up. I'm gonna stay on the road. A low-rise road. Another hour passes and you crest a small hillock, from the top of which you can see the path continuing downwards into a small settlement of huts. This must be Cantapani. Look at the village. Look for a way around or move on. Look at the village. From this distance, all you see on the town is its poverty. The fields on either side are brown with caked mud, and the few penned animals are thin and wizened like thirsty vines. No wonder the site master warriors don't trouble themselves to protect this place. There's nothing here to protect. Of course, if you were scared of a town like Cantapani, then you could not hope to survive in Kakabad proper. You follow the path down into the town, obviously. The round huts are made of a hard, baked, bright clay, and the roofs are thinly thatched. As you pass, eyes appear at dark doorways, tracking your every move. For a moment, it seems like this will be all you see of the town's inhabitants. But then, a villager appears from one of the dwellings and blocks your path. Look at him, threaten him, push him out of the way, or cast a spell. <laughs> Here comes the zaps, right? Just, you want me to Palpatine hands everybody I see? We can't just do a, a carbon copy playthrough of the one we did six years ago. We can't just Palpatine hands every person in the game. No, we can't do that. Look at, alright, how about we just look at him first? We don't know who this is. We don't know what this person is. We don't know what they're capable of. We don't know why they're here. They're standing in the road. Look at him. He is five feet tall. They cannot grow much taller out here in this poisonous air. He has thick set arms and thighs and is half clothed in tattered breeches. His eyes are wild and his long red hair and beard stand out from his face in a wiry tangle. Halt, stranger, he commands. What business you have in Cantapani? I want to buy equipment. He grunts, but you can see that he is pleased. 
With a motion, he encourages you to follow, uh, taking you through the village to a large hut. Inside you find that the building is a storage house. A quartermaster, somewhat plumper than your guide, is seated at a table. <laughs> oh no. Am I gonna kill this guy? This man here to do business. The villager explains. Get out of here, flea. The fat man replies, getting up from his seat to hustle the villager out. Then he turns to you with a smile and beckons you to sit. Greetings, stranger. Shall I show you my wares? The man wags a finger. Wait there. He disappears for a moment into a side room. Search the room or just wait for him? What if he has cameras? There might be cameras literally everywhere. While the man is out of sight, you quickly rifle the nearby shelves, but find nothing except for a small vial of potion. You pick up the vial, it is quite full and stoppered by an old cork, but there's no label to indicate what it might be. You slip back the stopper boom, to take a cautious sniff. The smell is truly appalling and you seal it up again. Blimberry? But what is it used for? The merchant returns, carrying a large box. For you, he declares, moving his hands as he speaks. You've come to the right place. This collection is the very best. Our most strange and interesting artifacts. <laughs> Collected from other travelers who've come this way. He begins to lay the items in front of you, treating each with great care. You have 20 gold pieces to spend, but is there anything here you'd really want to buy? You pick up a bamboo pipe off the table, carved with a split reed and six finger holes. Three gold pieces, the merchant says. That's so cheap. Never mind, we can buy everything. I can't promise you that it has any magic, but it may well cheer you up at night. I'm gonna play it. You place the pipe on your lips and blow a few clear, sweet notes. The merchant nods. It's a well-made little thing, don't you agree? <laughs> I just put it through my mouth and went like... <laughs> Alright, I'll buy it. You hand him three gold pieces and he thanks you with a nod. You place the pipe into your bag. Please, the merchant says. Something else today. What weapons do you have? The merchant looks at you carefully, sizing up what kind of customer you are. Kind of... The kind to place a newly bought dagger against his neck. Or the kind to tip him for the quality of the blade. But he must see your honor shining through as he wags his finger once more. And then collects an axe and a fine broadsword from another corner of the shop. These are both treasures, as well as deadly weapons of war. I'm sure you'll agree. I mean, we gotta, we gotta go axe, right? Yeah. You lift the axe from the table. The head is carved with symbols in a familiar language, but the quality of the shaft and head indicate that the axe is well used and may not last many more battles, right? You give him this is a shitty axe. It's had a lot of wear. I don't think it's worth that much. That price is too high for this, you reply. I'll give you five. The merchant looks uncomfortable, but eventually with a glance around his large storehouse, in this empty, unvisited village, he agrees. Very well. Five. But it is my children who will suffer for it. I'll take it, you reply, nodding once. You give him five gold pieces, put the axe into your pack. Please take your time. Keep looking. Well, let's look at the leather bag. You lift a bag from the table and its contents rattle. Teeth, the merchant replies, showing his own a little. Finest creature teeth. Three gold pieces, too. What kind of creature? You ask, goblins, giants, or mole rats? All sorts, the merchant replies. I couldn't tell you myself, I'm no expert. But there's ten or twelve in there for three gold pieces, that's a good price. You hand over three gold coins and take the bag of teeth. The merchant nods, then begins to pack his box away once more. I must save at least something for my next customer, he replies with a smile. But perhaps you will return this way and it'll be you. You get to your feet and take your leave from the merchant. Just outside the doorway in the sunshine, you pause to examine what you have acquired. You tilt the axe head in sunshine to read the carvings on the metal. This axe was crafted in the year of the ox. All right, there's like a all right, that, there's like a pig talking to me. This axe was crafted in the year of the ox for Glandragor the Protector. Its powers may be realized only by its owner. Interesting. You open the drawstring bag and sift through the contents. It's quite an assortment. There are three teeth from an ape, four from a goblin, two from a snatter cat, and a large molar from a giant that is the size of a ripe plum. That's pretty good. We got some materials now, but I have ran out of money. You head out of Cantapani and along the path into the Shumatanti Hills. 
Passing the outlying huts, you feel strangely uneasy. Hissings from within and sly faces disappearing from doorways make you feel decidedly unwelcome. Then at the edge of town, you pass a large boulder. And at once, two rough-cut villagers spring out with swords drawn. Bandits. It's two against one, the first declares. You lost, calls the other. So hand over your things, come on. You draw yourself to full height. You have mistaken me for someone else. I would like to give you a moment to reconsider. Because I will kill you if I have to. The bandits growl and advance on you. One on either hand. Okay. We have law, which is control non-intelligent creatures. Are they stupid enough to control? Jig cause lively dancing and I have the flute. I can make them dance. Make them dance? I mean, it ha right, come on. That, that's the comedy routine. All right, let's do Jig. You pull the bamboo flute from your bag, raise the spell, and begin to play a merry tune. The angry faces of the bandits turn to expressions of astonishment as they find their limbs jerking in time to the music, quite out of control. Their swords fly from their hands and they are soon dancing merrily around you. Lead them back to the village or lead them to the nearest pit in the ground. <laughs> Just make them walk off a cliff? The foothills around you are full of sudden drops, edges, and deep pits in the earth. Piping loudly, you lead the two bandits to the nearest gap in the ground you can find. Their expressions, already turning sour from exhaustion, move to looks of horror as they find themselves jumping and jigging on the edge of a pit. Then, with a final leap and clap, they disappear over the side. You put your murderous flute away, and continue on your journey towards the hills. About half an hour later, you reach the start of the climb into the hills proper and continue upwards. That was horrible. <laughs> Leaving Cantapani behind marks the true start of the wilderness. Beyond that tiny outpost, there are scattered homesteads and Kar, a thriving city port. But all are touched by cruelty, isolation, and fear. The Baklans and the long shadow cast by Mampang Fortress darken everything. And with the crown gone, stolen, things can only grow worse. In the long years since Kalana the Reformer founded the Alliance, the crown has been passed from kingdom to kingdom every four years, ensuring each one has had its turn to lead, but no more. Ruddlestone, Lenderland, Galantaria, and Bryce have all enjoyed its power, but not Annaland. But when the crown came to Annaland, it was stolen by Birdman from Zaman and carried off to Mampang. With the crown, the Archmage will be unstoppably powerful. There's no chance of sending an army against him. A military force would not survive the journey. So here you are, a lone hero, walking the long path to Mampang alone. Five minutes later, you reach a fork in the road. The sergeant, for all his eyesight, hadn't mentioned this. Fork in the road. Who is he talking to? You can... <laughs> You're going to pull a who is he talking to right now? I'm trying to get you immersed in the in the world of, of Annaland. Who is he talking to right now? Really? The road splits around the base of a gigantic tree, but does not rejoin on the other side. The left path winds down into a valley, and the right rises up a slope towards the first thick forest of the hills. Look right. It's hard to see much further uphill. The forest is sudden and thick and the path narrow. It may be hard going in that direction, but the hills will involve a lot of climbing eventually, and you may get a decent view of the next leg from the top of the ridge. You pause to consider the lower route. There's a river there, and the path follows the left bank. It's a safer route, secluded and protected, but the curve of the landscape would mean you were almost backtracking. You're about to make your choice when you hear a faint cry from somewhere close at hand. Make your choice. <laughs> Look around. You look around, then finally, up into the branches of the tree, a pair of wizened, calloused feet are dangling down over your head. About to drop on you, perhaps? Throw something at the tree. Who's there? Climb up. <laughs> Just throwing a rock up at the tree. <laughs> You just grab a boulder and just, just just hammer it up there. 
Climb up. You want to just climb up? Climb up. You swing yourself up onto the lowest branch of the tree, and the owner of the feet shrieks in alarm. You see it's an old man dressed in rags and as thin as bone. Oi! He calls, trying to retreat along the branch. What do you want? A few branches above him, you notice a buzzing beehive. What are you hiding from? Actually, that's a, that's a good point, considering that why is he up here? Oh, the old man got up the tree is a puzzle. He must have been escaping someone fearsome to climb so high. What are you hiding from? You cry. Damned elephants. I were traveling from Dumpus to the outpost settlement in Annaland, but I were waylined by elephants. Robbed me blind, all but took my eyes, and left me up here in the tree. I keep getting older, you see. We all do. But some worse than others. Climbed up, but now I'm too old to get down. You reach up and grab the old man by the waist. He is as light as a leaf, and within a moment, you've lifted him to the ground. Thanks for that, he remarks, brushing himself down and almost knocking himself over in the process. Oh, I was just starting to get a bit, you know, perturbed. But I'm on the safe side now. He seems remarkably confident, considering that the slightest stumble might break him into bits. What will you do now? Keep going for Annaland, he says. That's where I set off from. While back now. You wouldn't believe the story if I told you. Suffice to say, though, if I know my eyes from my eyes, or you're heading up to Mampang, and you better be smarter than I was. And here. He presses a page into your hand. It is a page torn from a spell book. This might be some use to you. I found it. I just found it. Mind, I don't go asking how, but it's no good to me anymore. You look the page over suspiciously. It seems to be half of a spell. Ha. Ah. C-A. That might have been used for pest repulsion, but it is unworkable in its current state. You take the page and thank him. Climb up to the hive. Leaving the old man sighing with gratitude on the ground, you climb higher through the branches of the tall tree. The beehive hangs like a ripe fruit from the very highest branch. A huge number of bees dance in and swarm out and about. Climb higher or use magic or give up. Zap the beehive? Guys, I only have 10 health. You get your balance enough to free your hands for a spell. Go for law? Let's do it. You cast the spell concentrating on the swarm that surrounds the beehive. You feel your mind taking control of theirs. Several hundred small consciousnesses falling under your will. You lead them like a general directing an army away from the hive, allowing you to clamor up and relieve them of a succulent honeycomb and a nice ball of beeswax. That's a nice trick! The old man remarks. You stash your finds in your pack. The light is fading. It's time to move on. Oh! The man cries suddenly. Do you want to hear me riddle? I learned it from the elephants. Sure. You gesture with a hand for him to speak. See him though he sees you not. A stinging beast in a box not left. To guard a key it is his lot. To goal a witch of luck bereft. <laughs> You thank him. You nod once, and then you turn your attention to the path ahead. All right. The high path or the low path? Where am I going? We're going through the forest here. Or over the road here on the low path. This goes through the forest and into the mines here, or potentially up through the river area up here. This goes across potentially to this big open field thing, and then this little village or this village here. If we go this way, we cannot go this way. All right, the high path. Let's go. The high route seems the most secure. In a valley, you can be easily observed from above and led astray. But out on the hills, you can go whichever way you choose. Of course, when night falls, it may be cold and exposed up on the slopes, but no matter. This journey was never destined to be easy. You begin to climb, letting the old man's jabbering fade quickly away. He's still with us, by the way. The path winds upwards into the hill, into the cover of a wood. The afternoon sun glints through the trees and plays tricks on your eyes. Every so often you catch a glimpse of some strange shaped animal or other watching you, only to find that it's the silhouette of branches and leaves caught at an odd angle. The climb continues with the path twisting this way and that. The air grows cold and the sun flickers on the horizon, then sets, making it hard to see your way. But the moon is full, and when twilight is done, it will be bright once more. But to tire yourself out on the first day would be inauspicious. 
you settle down to make camp for the night. In a natural shelter provided by the roots of three gigantic intertwined trees. Your backpack will serve for a pillow and your cloak for a blanket. Before settling to sleep, you check through your pack. You have two rations left. Let's just sleep. Oh, shit. <laughs> Spoiler alert. Ah, that was, a, that was a problem. You lay yourself out on the ground and are quickly asleep. The moon is full and high in the sky when you are next opening your eyes. You feel warm and more cozy than you did before, as if wrapped in a gigantic blanket. There is a pain in your leg. Slowly you realize what is happening. A giant bat has settled on your chest and is feeding on your leg. Uh, I could do jig? Will this work on an animal? <laughs> oh, oh, will this, does this work on animals? What if it doesn't work on animals? This take. This is free to do though. Let's do it. You raise the spell and play a sweet tune on the bamboo pipe. The bat begins to hop absurdly from foot to foot, spinning around and holding out its wings. You entertain yourself with the thing for a few minutes, then grab it in one hand and lob it away into the trees, where it takes flight not to return. Smiling to yourself, you settle back down. So what, I just like so long bowsered it into the trees? Once again, the crown fills your dreams. Only now, instead of being hidden away in Mampang, fortress by the Archmage, you see it on the head of the burly villager from Cantapani. Anyone can wear the crown, he declares to you. But wearing the crown, you are no longer just anyone. And then he points a finger at you that seems to crackle with energy. And you find yourself drawn towards him, commanded to do his bidding. Suddenly, you're surrounded by angry bees. You're walking towards a crack in the ground. It seems sure to swallow you whole. You stumble at its edge. You're about to fall. The second day of your journey begins in the morning cool. Still halfway between sleeping and waking, you feel the presence of your spirit, the ape, close nearby. Its form has changed since you left Annaland, just as you have changed, but still walking beside you. In the temple, they taught you that a prayer to your spirit could heal disease, lift curses, even save you from certain death. But the spirits are not generous and decline to help often. You can now ask for aid with the pray button. So this is interesting because over the course of the game, you get certain gods that you pray to and it changes based on what you do in your actions and stuff, right? So right now we have the ape, a strong beast, intelligent and prudent, who takes great pride in acting faithfully to be depended upon. During certain scenarios, you can pray, and the ape might help or might not. It kind of depends on who it is. You can feel yourself getting accustomed to the fetid air of these hills. You've now ascended several hundred feet and can expect to make excellent progress before the end of the day. As you crest the brow of a hill, you see something that makes you stop in your tracks. To your left is a clearing, and in the clearing are several poles planted firmly in the ground. And atop each pole is a head. The heads are all kinds and ages. Some are recently fixed while others have decayed and some are nothing but skulls and hair. There are human heads, goblin heads, and one or two heads of creatures you do not recognize. All have sewn up eyes and mouths. A large X painted on a rock nearby is obviously intended as a warning not to venture any further. But ahead the road forks, left and right, and you cannot be sure which path you are warned not to take. The right-hand path continues to climb, and the left-hand path glides down the side of the hill. Okay, the climb continues up the hill for several hours until you are not far from the top. Then the faint sound of bustling activity reaches you. Trampling feet, grunting voices, and the clanking of metal against rock. There's something ahead, hidden by the ancient trees that line these slopes. You leave the path and continue through the woods. A short distance onwards, you hide behind a tree and survey a clearing. A number of goblins are in the clearing, working at the mouth of an open cave. They trudge in and out of the opening, carrying large bowls in their arms, piled up with glistening rocks and dull metallic nuggets. Watch them work, leave them to it, make a break for the cave entrance. I'm going to watch them. You stay hidden, getting a sense of the scale of the operation. 
There are at least 30 goblins inside the cave, each coming out every few minutes or so with a new pail of stones. Then there are other goblins working in the clearing with hammers, smashing the rocks into small pieces, extracting metals from inside, loading them into carts, and finally pushing the carts away down a wide track between the trees. It is quite some operation, but not without its weaknesses. There are too many goblins to create any kind of distraction, but they move away into the trees fairly often, and sometimes the cave is left unguarded. Try to slip inside the cave, try to steal from the bulls, or leave and go back to the path. Try to steal from the bulls? I, I want to try to get some, yeah, let's try to get some, I mean, there's probably like diamonds in here. Steal. You wait for the right moment, then leap out from behind the tree to snatch a little of the glistening rock from the nearest bull. It's hard to pick out good metal from bad so fast, but you manage to lift a couple of pieces worth of gold. But your actions have not gone unnoticed. You're quickly surrounded by three goblins, all armed with picks and ready to use them. No, hot either. I don't have access to it. I'll zap. Let's go for it. I am to create some lightning, guys. For the first time. In seven years. I'm about to cast zap. You cast the spell and point at the nearest goblin. A streak of lightning shoots from your finger and catches the creature squarely in the chest, killing it instantly. The smoke <laughs> clears. The second goblin, enraged, rushes into attack before you can raise the spell again. Alright, so I got a much bigger stamina bar. We're gonna just go about... Let's go six. Yeah, that's alright. It's alright. The second goblin growls and gnashes its teeth, then throws away its pick and snatches up a shovel. This one you realize is vicious and an idiot. You strike for its head. The goblin raises his shovel and hides under the blade. Get out of here. You push forward, showing no mercy, leaping over a cart. You drive your blade straight for his throat. The blow connects, and the creature falls down to the dirt, dead. There is no time before the third goblin's on you. This third goblin is bigger than the others, and furious at the death of his comrades. He paces forward menacingly. You show him the force of your blade, and the goblin jumps quickly back. He escapes largely unscathed. From arm's length, he hisses and glows. Full blast. Kill him. Dead. You strike again with vicious force. It is the final blow. The goblin drops to the dust, and the clearing falls quiet. You quickly rifle the bodies. There are two gold pieces, a pathetically small sum to be killing for. There are also eight goblin teeth lying around. <laughs> oh my god, take them. I have 10 goblin teeth. I can make a whole army soon. Working quickly, you gather up the teeth and add them to the bag you bought at Cantapani. That, that's done. It's time to move on. There'll be other goblins here soon enough. You've been lucky that you have emerged from the woods while you were dispatching these. Quickly, you hurry back into the trees, leaving the mine behind you, continuing on along the path with the tall trees at either side. The path climbs again up a low hill, covered over with thick bushes and shrubs that snag at your clothing. Halfway up, you hear a sound. Twigs breaking. Freeze. You freeze as a large creature the size of a bear emerges directly in front of you. It has black and white fur and a long bushy tail that trails out behind. It growls menacingly. Oh no, it's a snake cat. You will not be able to avoid a confrontation. The creature is a skunk bear. And when it raises its tail, it releases a nauseating odor. The smell that hangs around is terrible. Wow, all right, there's some weird things here. What about... Sap? Cause depression. Six? Clone the caster. <laughs> so I just clone myself and go, you go do it. Nap? Cause sleepiness. I don't have the item. Mm, I'll do six. Let's do... Let's, let's, let's clone ourselves. That's only one. Let's do it. You cast a spell and in a flash, five replicas of yourself appear in front of the creature. The confused beast lurches forward to attack one of them, and you use the opportunity to escape, leaving your magic clones to fight your battle for you. The path leads down through another valley and back up a hill. Two hours pass. <laughs> the sun is now just past its zenith, and everywhere a dusty heat rises from the baked earth. You begin to think about where you will stay for the night. Another night sleeping out in the open would be best avoided. But then you see a small village set into a hill. Look at it. 
Smoke rises from the stacks. The houses are well set, with stone at their bases and thatched roofs of grasses and thick leaves. There is unusually more than just the one street running through the center of town. It's as though this place, once rich, has had its heart scooped away. Litter surrounds the buildings, and on the edge of the village are rows and rows of empty, abandoned houses. You continue your slow trudge along the path. You walk into the village. Young hill dwellers pass you and stare at your strange clothes. You nod back respectfully. Look at the people. Their own attire is rough by comparison to your gear. They wear their hair long, but piled up on their heads. These people are ghastly poor. The village is like a ghost town here on the knife edge of the backlands. Walking down the single road, you quickly find a hut with its front covered, hold wide open, and the smell of brewed beer coming from inside. You go in. Several hill dwellers are here, talking gruffly. When you enter, they watch you with understandable caution. The owner of the hut comes over to you. Welcome to Cristatanti. What do you want? An evening's rest and a drink to wet my throat, you reply. Well, is one gold piece. Please sit. You go over to the table where the hill dwellers are. Sit with the old man, sit with the young man. Who voice Andy? That's the way it is, all right? Old. You turn your attention to the oldest man at the table. Whatever face he once had is lost in a labyrinth of wrinkles, and his skin is the color of tanned hide from a lifetime of the beating sun. <laughs> what are you looking at? The old man's face curls up like burnt paper into a kind of smile. Don't get too many travelers around here. So I'm looking at you. Where are you from? I come from Annaland. Hmm. Not many has crossed through Cantapani Gate in either direction. If you know what I'm saying. You should go and look. The gate has exploded. <laughs> Like, what, like, I didn't do that? You should go and look, the gate exploded. You grin widely. If they haven't fixed it, you might be able to get in at last. <laughs> the old man laughed. <laughs> now my place is here. They say there's a war coming. Something to do with a crown. Crown? You ask cautiously. The crown of kings. They say it's how a leader leads. Without the crown on your head, no one will follow you. The crown can raise an army from the farmyard or command a population to walk into the sea. Sounds like a bad idea, if you ask me. But if someone's got to wear it, I'd rather they were in Annaland than Mampang. You sip your beer. The old man exchanges glances with the younger man sitting opposite. Can you tell me something about this region, you ask? Christatanti? Certainly. I'll tell you that around here, we're always glad to help out strangers. What lies beyond this town? Beyond Crestatani, there are two paths. One takes you past Aliana's home, and you will need your wits about you if she's there. The other leads up into the hills of Lea Key, domain of the Great Ones. Either way you choose, I wish you the luck of Sindla on your journey. The god changed, by the way. We have the monkey now, not the ape. No one talks like this. Yes, they do. All old men talk like this in fantasy literature and fantasy movies and TV shows. We all talk like this very, very th theatrically. Who is Sindla? God of hopeless causes, the man replies and laughs. The crowd in the inn is starting to thin out. You finish your beer in a single drought and get to your feet. You make to leave the inn. The owner stops you, holding out his hand. All right, I'm going to pay him. I got, well, I'm not going to be a dick. You pay him his gold piece and step out into the street. You look this way and that, trying to decide what to do next. When you realize the old man has joined you once more, he ignores you and is gone. It's now evening and time to sleep. You stop a passerby and ask for an inn, and they lead you there directly. The woman who runs the place stands in the doorway with her arms folded. Are you from the king? She demands. No, I'm a traveler. I am on a mission for the king. We're, we're, getting, we're getting a party of old men. Do I just lie? No, I'm a traveler. I don't want to give attention to myself. No, I'm a mere traveler. 
The woman narrows her eyes at you. This is a guest house, the best in Cristatante. Only guests stay. And any guest of mine knows it costs me three gold pieces to host a man overnight, and two to feed him. But it's all between friends. I need to eat first. Food is just being served. The woman steps aside, and you go inside and sit down. A few minutes later, her husband appears with a steaming pot of skunk bear stew. As you eat, you can't help but remember the terrible smelling beast dead on the path, and the thought makes you gag. You wolf it down all the same and leave your coins on the table. Do you want a room as well? Um, yes, I do. Thank you. The woman shows you the way upstairs to a room. There are three other guests already staying and asleep. So you settle quickly. The bed is not clean, but it is comfortable. And after a long day and all its narrow escapes, you're grateful beyond measure for the rest. Your dreams are vivid once again. You're walking endlessly, the hills moving up and down under your feet like a rippling sea. Every step exhausts you, but no step moves you forward. Meanwhile, a tall black creature strides towards you, wreathed in a foul-smelling smoke. And in the distance, a deep voice is booming with laughter. The long, cruel fingers of one hand are curled around the metal frame of a crown. And with the other, he beckons you, forward, as if into a trap. You wake early and sit for a moment, in no great hurry to leave the village. This is now the third day of your journey, and the muscles in your legs are feeling lean and strong from so much walking. You spend a short while enjoying the peace, then unhurriedly collect your possessions and set off along the path. Cristatante is surrounded by several miles of fields. It sits in a well-protected ring of hills, and is close enough to the river to be reasonably prosperous. As you follow the path between lines of sun-baked crops, you come to a fork in the road. The right-hand way leads past a set of outbuildings, while the left heads directly off into deep woodland. Your journey is too important to slow down talking to locals. You must pass unseen, and so you disappear into the jungle of all tall trees. For a short while, the sun is fervorous, feverous even, and then you are between the trees once more, and everything becomes cool and still. You walk for several hours uneventfully, this land that was never settled or explored, and very few travel this way. In places, bushes and shrubs have grown over into the path. Hack your way through or move cautiously, just wildly swinging your fucking sword. Moving carefully forward, you use your sword to cleave the bushes. Your progress is quick, but silent. Then you come to a fork in the road, still deep in the forest. Someone has thought to make a sign, perhaps as a guide, or perhaps as a warning. The way to the right is marked for Dumpus. A left turn points to Aliana, a name you remember from what the man in Cristatanti told you. Neither way seems the better trod. You will have to choose. The path winds between trees that get greener and more lush. You must be closer to the river here, although you cannot hear the water. After about half an hour's walk through dappled shade, you come across a well-built hut. Flowers decorate its walls and the door has been painted with ornate designs. The path ends here. Knock on the door. Scout around it. Just knock on the front door. Right? Just go knock. Knock. You approach the door and knock. There is no reply. You perform a swift circuit around the hut, but find nothing unusual or concerning. Seems to be what it is. A hut. Set by itself deep in the forest. But for someone to survive out here on their own, surrounded by the beasts of the jungle... They must be someone quite powerful. This is sus as fuck. <laughs> Alright, open it. You push open the door and stride inside. Inside the house. The hut is neatly laid out. You detect the touch of a fastidious woman. Chairs are set around a table as if for guests. A mattress lies in one corner, and a large kitchen area indicates that whoever lives here... They're fond of cooking. Take what I can. Or call out. They're like, do, 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 grab, grab. Like, why would you steal? Why, I, you can't just steal everything. I'm gonna, we'll call out. We have to, right? We can't just take everything. Hello? Is there anybody here? To your surprise, a voice answers quickly. Who's there? Who is that? Ignore it. Locate the speaker. I warn you, I am armed. 
I broke into your house and I have a weapon. Why would I do that? Looking into a corner hidden by a large cupboard, you see a cage in which a young woman is imprisoned. Good stranger, let me out of this cage, I beg you. You move over to the cage, quite shocked. What happened to you? Oh, good stranger, I've been locked up here for two days. It was Elvins that did it. Those mischievous, prankful Elvins, please, you must help me. I have not eaten and they left me here where I can see all my cooking things but cannot reach them. I'll help you. Going over to the cage, you try for the door. It's locked, of course. You should be grateful I waste my strength on you. You declare as you roll up your sleeves. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> no, I can't. I can't. What is pep? Cause strength? <laughs> what a dick. Raz? Sharpen my blade? Should I just do it? But what if I kill her? I don't, I don't want to kill this person. Dop is... It's de it's dop. Dop is... Wait, this... Cause slowness? <laughs> Why would I do... I'm doing this! You begin the spell. Aliana watches you and must have some understanding of magic as she calls out to you. Wait, what are you? But it's too late. The spell has taken effect and Aliana has passed out on the floor of her cage. <laughs> away. Perfect. Now you can search this place in peace. You begin to carefully search the drawers and cupboards of the hut. It's very empty. Perhaps whoever locked the woman up robbed her themselves. All you find is two gold pieces and a pouch containing soft brown sand. I thought you didn't want to steal. What's the, what's the sand? Can I just see what the sand is? Take everything. You pocket both and turn to go. The woman snores quietly away as you slip out of the hut. You retrace your steps to the last junction. Wait, hold on. Whoa. The vixen? The, this is my new god. The vixen is a creature of high cunning and low morals. She will lie, cheat, swindle, and slide, sidle her way out of trouble and into riches, always taking care to cover her trail. I've never seen that before. You need to rewind, you monster. All right, this is an important thing for us to decide if we continue to do this. I would like you all to vote. Besides death, Okay, because you, you could. There are hundreds of ways to die in this game at any moment. Besides dying, am I allowed to rewind? Oh, this winning! Wow, I'm surprised. I'm really surprised. I thought that that was not going to win. Okay, all right. You get three rewinds. Rewind, rewind, rewind tokens. I can have three rewinds total per part, per game, per episode. Okay, so I so but I get to decide when I use those rewinds, right? Three times per game? Okay. I'm not using it here. I'm not using it here. I don't need, I don't have to go back. I got a bunch of sand. I'm not using it here. <laughs> Omega lol, what the fuck? We should get one. Wait, I, just because I can rewind doesn't mean I have to. I don't wanna, but what if I need, what if there's a really important thing that happens? I'm not using it here. This is not to, to me. I, I made out from that exchange. Do you understand? I got a bunch of sand. Which that's fucking pretty sick, if you ask me. <laughs> that's so worthless. <laughs> You're a piece of shit. Why? I, I casted like the, the, the go to sleep spell and I stole everything in this person's house. No, I am sleeping in that bed. I want to keep the sand. Wait, let me decide. Wait, let me determine. Can I is sand actually for a spell? Because if it is, I want to know what it is. Mud. Ooh. <laughs> While casting, the caster must sprinkle grains of sand onto the floor to create a pool of quicksand. Any creature stepping into the quicksand will slowly be sucked away. Are you shitting me? I've got quicksand now. Aliana died for this. Aliana didn't die, okay? Look, I'm playing a chaotic, lawful good. You walk for several hours, following the twists and turns of the path through the trees. Then suddenly you stop. You've heard a noise up ahead. 
Something is moving around between the rocks at the edge of the path. Vixen. <laughs> draw my sword. You draw your sword and ready, and you're glad you did. Because a moment later you're attacked. In a flurry of foliage and dirt, a rat bear leaps from underground. It's much closer than you thought. Its sleek black fur allows it to hide in the shadows until it's almost upon you. You bring your sword. I'm glad I did that. Holy shit. Okay, this is bad. This thing, he's got, look at this fucking bar. Um, I'm gonna defend. Good thing I did. The rat bear is startled by your approach, but drops quickly to all fours. You drop quickly behind a tree and raise your sword, ready to defend yourself. At the last moment, the rat bear leaps, all claws off the ground and gnarling and lunging at you. You brace yourself as it comes down. It rears back, claws raised. All right, we're gonna go four. No, six. Fuck. Okay. You risk an attack. Rushing forward, you charge at the rat bear, but it has read your intention and drops into a crouch. It grunts as it pushes you away. Afraid of you, it stumbles back, tail whipped high in defense. All right. You're going to go for an, probably another defense, right? Let's do two. Yep, that's good. That's fine. Sidestepping, you slash out at the rat bear, but it knocks you aside with a paw. You scratch the creature's hide. It squeaks and snuffles, standing up on its hind legs. It's coming in for a hard one. Do I have enough, though? Kill him. Don't root for the rat bear. Why? Because I took a bunch of sand from some lady's house? Fainting left, you slice at the rat bear. But it bats you back into the mud with its tail. It's weakening little by little. It drops to all fours and lowers its head. All right, I think it's coming in hard. Ooh. Good. Splashing through the mud, you race into the rat bear, catching it at light blow. Light plays through the trees, and for a moment, the true extent of the rat bear's injuries are revealed. All right, I gotta go fall blast. We're good. Get out of here, I win. You risk an attack, you charge into the rat bear, then your sword slips between the creature's ribs and drives deep into its putrid heart. The rat bear squeals and falls to the ground, face down in the mud. Competent combat. The path winds a few more times around gigantic trees, thousands of years old, and then emerges onto a sudden plain, as if the forest had been scooped away by a gigantic hand. A river trickles thinly between short grasses, and by its bank stands a tiny village. Today has been a short day with few true dangers. With a decent meal and a night's sleep, your next day will start auspiciously. So you begin the gentle climb down into the village. You follow the path down into the village, passing a sign, which declares it to be Dumpus. The streets are thin and narrow, and the buildings have been set close together, as if trying to withstand a storm. There's a terrible smell hanging in the air. All in all, it seems an unpleasant place. Why did you leave that person in the cage? I... I don't, I don't know. I, did, I t stole stuff. I don't know, because I, I just did. Because I'm evil. No, I just, I didn't, I wanted to click it and see what happened. And then I didn't want to waste a rewind on it. You killed her. I didn't kill anybody. I didn't kill anybody. She's going to starve in there. She's going to be fine. I don't, w go steal more stand. Go steal more sand. I'm talking to the villagers. All right, you pass along the main path through the village and pause outside a hut in which several of the disheveled hill dwellers are sitting and eating. They seem deep in discussion about something. Several are shaking their fists in the air. Lifting back the canvas flap, you step inside. The hill dwellers stop talking immediately and look up at you. One gets to his feet and gestures you forward. <laughs> I'm gonna bow. You nod your head once to the man who returns the gesture. Then one of the others calls something in their native tongue and points at your side to where your sword hangs out below the hem of your cloak. In broken common tongue, the first man croaks. No weapons! And he indicates a table by the door where you can leave the blade. Look at the table. There are plenty of other weapons there, so the man, they appear to be honest enough. You unfasten your sword belt and leave your weapon on the table. The hill dwellers nod to show their appreciation, and then beckon you to sit with them. Then, they continue their conversation just as animately as before, speaking in a local tongue that you cannot follow. But as they talk, they pour you a drink and provide you with food. They seem quite welcoming. As you eat, you listen, catching a few words here and there. Goblins. Arms. Christatanti. They seem to be very concerned. Your interest peaked. You keep listening. 
Slowly, you piece together the story. The group seem... I just burped. The group seem quite sure that a horde of goblins are planning an attack on Christatanti, which is apparently one of the wealthier spots in the hills. They are discussing whether or not it would be worth helping the village to defend itself, which might mean they are offered some kind of reward. You must help them. You declare earnestly. Christatanti does not help us, one of the men points out. They are rich. We are poor. You will place them in your debt. The men nod, swayed by your ruthless logic. And you? How do you fight? One man asks you. I serve myself. The men nod. So you do not understand what we might lose. The evening draws to a close. The men thank you for your counsel and leave one by one. All right, that's one. <laughs> that's one. 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 Okay. I will help those that need it. Wait, what? I will help those that need it. The men nod. Let the goblins attack tonight, they cheer. We'll, we will use your strength. The evening draws to a close. The men thank you for your counsel and leave. <laughs> I'm fucking out of here. I'm leaving. I'm out of here. I'm literally out of here. I'm out of here. I'm going to fucking leave right now. <laughs> I can't rewind a second time. I'll, okay, I'm going to... Fine, I'll stick around. I'm going to explore the town. Fine. Halfway along the track, you come across a couple of merchants' huts. You browse for items worth buying with your nine gold pieces. Your attention is taken by a finely woven skull cap, a finely crafted sword, and a small bag of provisions. Same as skull cap. You pick up the skull cap and turn it over. Stolen from a priest of Dadu Lay, the merchant declares with pride. A fine piece of work. Four gold pieces. You can tell from the feel of the cloth that has no inherent magic, but it might be useful in spells. You place it on your head, but you feel nothing. You take it off again. I'm on it. You pay him four gold pieces. You place the skull cap in your sack. That's enough. You nod to the merchant. Is there anything else I can help you with? Yeah, no, I, I think I can use that. Hold on. Yep. Hell, to activate this spell, the caster must wear a cloth skull cap. The user may then read the mind of any intelligent creature nearby, learning its weaknesses, the contents of nearby rooms, and other such details. Is there any work to be had here? I need to earn some money. The merchant sizes you up. You look like a good worker to me. One of my friends needs some digging doing. I'm sure he would pay you and feed you for it. Digging what? You ask. The merchant shifts uncomfortably. Does it matter? You'll find out. He stares at you. So? He looks over his shoulder at the path. I'm going that way now myself. You coming? The goblins attack tonight. I'm going to go like dig stuff for like money. He leads you to a house on the edge of the village and introduces you to the householder. A stout man who is probably incapable of lifting a spade, let alone digging with it. I'm ready to get started. What is it you need doing? Cesspit. Out back. Needs digging. Um, how much? Well, it's pretty urgent. The old one's overflowing. How much money? Three gold pieces. That's it? I don't remember doing this. Did I do this in the other playthrough? You can keep your money. No, I'll get started. Spades at back. He replies with a jerk of his thumb. You walk through the man's house into the back garden. The smell is terrible. The job is not just to dig a new cesspit, but to dig over the old one. And it's going to be several hours work that'll probably take the whole night. You collect the spade stuck in the ground by the hole. Oh, I can do big. Grow in size. Do toilet magic. <laughs> All right, I'm doing it. You cast the spell and point your finger at the hole in the ground. With a flash, a burst of lightning flies from your hand and hits the ground. Earth explodes upwards, and when the air clears, you have created a fine hole. A little rough around the edges, perhaps, but you still saved yourself plenty of work. I did the same thing? <laughs> I did the same thing. 
<laughs> Recycled zap. I did the same thing. You go back into the house and collect your- I did? I did- ah. Shit, I did the same thing. It's the- I- this is literally a rerun. Fuck, really? <laughs> Shit. It's alright, it's fine, it's classic. You go back into the house and collect your money. Three gold pieces. The grateful householder also provides you with some food. As well as a spare- as well as a space on the floor to rest for the remainder of the night. You settle down and fall asleep quickly. <laughs> you dream strange dreams as you sleep. Your thoughts are dominated by the strange woman in the hut. In your mind, she has become younger and more beautiful than she truly was. Flowers seem to blossom from her hair, as though she was grown from the earth itself. Overhead, you fancy you hear the flap of giant wings. The birdmen came for the crown, perhaps. Before this journey is finished, they will come for you. You rise early, dismiss the attentions of the householder, and head out onto the street. Within a few minutes of walking, you are out of Dumpus and back on the road. After another hour or so, the way branches, with one path leading up into the hills and the other turning downhill and along one side of a barren stony ridge. Is that a village you can make out on the top of the hill? Seems a lonely place for it. The gentle upward slope becomes a steep climb, and you're forced to rest several times. So far, you've been walking through the foothills. Now the journey will become more serious. When finally you reach the summit and can look out over the low plateau you've crested, you see the path runs through a small settlement of crudely fashioned huts. There are villagers out in the street talking and working. It seems a happy, bustling place, despite the filth in the streets and the barren surroundings. Why do I have a memory of this place? I, like, remember this person's face. Another filthy city. Yeah, every city is, like, filthy. You see the filth, the stench in the air. You stay at your vantage point and watch a while longer to see if things change. After a while, you begin to notice something strange about the way the people in the village are moving. First, you notice one is limping, then another. Then you realize they are all shuffling as they move. Some use sticks. One is even crawling. Watch more. You stay hidden and watch for longer. After a while, you realize that whatever is happening in the village, it is desperate. There's no laughter, no joy. There's no trade or commerce. The women do not walk about, and the men do not watch them. It is like a prison camp. These are people in need of a savior. You may not be that man, but you can try. You approach arms open to show you are not a threat. But the message is not understood. The village... The villagers see you and panic. They begin to scurry inside their huts as if you were an army and not a lone traveler. Their bodies are thin and malnourished, and as they disappear through their doors, you notice some are missing limbs. Walk straight through the village. Uh, stop at a door and knock. Um, am I gonna get attacked? You knock on the door of one of the nearest huts. There is no reply. You approach the next hut. From inside, you hear the murmur of voices, so you enter. The hovel is tiny and foul, with no furnishing of any kind. A small fire burns in the middle of the floor, and by the far wall, a family of three cowers from you. The woman lifts a shaking hand, as if to hold you back. Rock. Turn them to stone. <laughs> That's fucking awful. Wait. Dim. Cause stupidity. <laughs> D doc, heal disease. Holy shit! I can heal the I can heal the disease. I can heal disease. I can heal them. I have a potion. Remember the potion I took in the very beginning of the game? Remember I sniffed it. I smelled the potion. I can fucking heal them. I don't think I've ever done this in like the three playthroughs I've ever done. I don't think I've done this. Go. You pour the blimberry juice out onto your palm and cast your spell across it. Then you cast the liquid onto the terrified villagers. At first, the potion seems to burn them. But then you realize it is the peeling skin, boils and warts that are burning away. The man is shivering as though he has been cold for days. And through chattering teeth, he declares, You have cured us. We have suffered the plague. <laughs> plague? Goodbye! Plague? So that's what affects this village. The man nods. We are no village, in truth. 
A few of us were cast out of Viratanti. A few from Dumpus and a few from other places. They forced us here with flaming torches to live or die. He looks at his wife, who is weeping. Most do not live. How many are here? Thirty, perhaps, the man replies. We were a hundred once, please. He steps forward, hands outstretched. You have saved us. You can save the others. You shake your head, I cannot. As you show them the empty potion bottle, they understand. So what should we do? You must leave immediately. The woman is looking at her hands. Her skin is soft once more and richly brown. But we are well, we are blessed. The magic will wear off in a few hours. You must leave before then or you will become ill once more. They do not hesitate. Taking nothing, they race back along the path towards Dumpus. You head quickly the other way. From across the plateau, you see the man pause and shout something at you. Beware the Black Lotus! Then he's gone. Somebody just said, Rock ro Rotus. Like Scooby-Doo? <laughs> Why Scooby-Doo? rut ro Ro, Raggy! rut ro Black Lotus, Raggy! Germa, they're in the way to the goblin attacked village. You haven't saved anybody. <laughs> oh no, I sent them to their deaths. That's right. Oh my god, you're right. That's horrible. What's new Scooby-Doo? Coming after you. Gonna fight. Hold on. Gonna fight. No, I can't do it. I can't. I'm not good enough. Some way down the hill, you stop for a rest and sit on a boulder to survey what lies ahead. The path leads downwards and at its foot, cradled between three peaks is a village and quite a large one at that. Behind you, the sun is falling rapidly into the hills. It will be night soon. The village looks like a good place to stop. You hop down from the boulder and make your way forward when an overhanging branch touches your face and you hear a lively chirping. You turn around quickly. Hovering by your shoulder is a small creature the size of a bird. It is childlike, but very thin, with green skin, and it flits around you on transparent wings. It seems friendly enough. It even lands on your shoulder, its tiny clawed toes pinching slightly. Greetings, little creature. And hello to you, the creature replies, chirping. My name is Jan. See that village? The creature replies. Last time I tried to go through, they told me I wasn't welcome, so I wouldn't mind some protection. What are you? The creature does a backflip and gives a low bow. I'm Minnie. I'm a Minnie Mart. Pleased to meet you. It reaches out a tiny hand and shakes your earlobe. The creature starts hopping up and down. Come on. Let's get going, can't we? What do you know about the village? You point down the valley. Is it safe? That's Spiritanti. It's very safe. It's the largest village in the whole of Shumanhati Hills. Every traveler who comes this way spends at least one night here. So it's a little bit expensive. Especially for mini mites. But pleasant enough. Alright, I can protect you. The creature squeezes your shoulder gently. It's like having a spider trying to burrow into your skin. The creature flits to your other shoulder once more. You're not in a, any hurry, are you? It observes. Do you want to sleep out in the rough? Let's get going. The creature shakes you by the ear in excitement, and you set off along the path once more. You descend into the bowl of the valley. The hills on either side are toweringly tall and throw the village into deep shadow. It would seem a very gloomy, threatening place, but from the streets come the distant sound of laughter and merriment. You continue along the path. The sounds of festivities grow louder. It's almost spooky. Here in the shade of the valley, and after so long on the dire road, the people in this village seem to be enjoying themselves. See? The Minimite on your shoulder remarks. I told you it was a happy place. What's going on? Jan, what's going on here? Are they bewitched? No. If there was magic, believe me, I'd know. This is the festival of the young. What? What is that? Well, take a look. Jan waves his little hand around the village. The idea is that once a year, the children are allowed the freedom of the village. It's a time of great fun and lots of pranks. It becomes quickly obvious what he means. You pass the first building, 
first few buildings, where you find a number of children sitting in the street and drinking ale from deep mugs. Further on, a young boy is holding an old woman over his knee and is spanking her. On the other side of the street, a group of boys is fighting outside a hut with a sign that reads, Glandragor's Tavern. Funny, you've definitely seen that name somewhere before. Wait a minute, I, that's the axe! The axe has that, isn't it Glandragor's axe? Dude, let's get in there and let's get, let's figure out what's going on with this axe! Behind the bar, a thick-set man is wiping mugs down with an old rag. Greetings, stranger. I'm Glandragor. Can I be helping you? I've come a long way. I'm sure you have. Take a seat. You do so, and Jan leaps up onto the counter. Glandragor seems amused rather than alarmed by the creature. I have something for you. Oh, yes? He looks at you expectantly. Give him the axe. Should I give him the axe? Give him the axe right now. You take the axe from your pack and lay it on the bar. The old man's eyes light up as he sees it. Where did you get that? He exclaims. I bought it from a merchant. But it's yours, isn't it? He reaches forward almost nervously. He is clearly overjoyed. I haven't seen this thing in at least 20 years. I'm was... I, I spent every day with it. He mimes a gentle chopping motion with the blade, perfectly pitched at neck height on a goblin. Incredible. I remember the weight. How'd you lose it? I was part of a raiding party. There were four of us exploring the giant's ruins at Lea Key. We descended into a cave system and the roof collapsed. I was knocked unconscious. They left me. Couldn't get me out, I suppose. Except that someone reached me enough to steal my famous axe. He did own Nixia with that axe. <laughs> did you ever find out who it was? No. He shakes his head sadly. No, I went on a healthy quest for revenge. But I never got it. Got something else instead that made me hang up my traveling boots. And if you don't know what that is yet, well, you will. Now here, I'm forgetting my hospitality. Without putting down the axe, he quickly gathers a mug and fills it with ale. For you, on the house. You thank him and drain the mug deep. The beer is thick and refreshing. Then it is his turn to question you. How long are you staying here? Only for tonight. I see. Well, and he nods. Let me give you some advice. There's a site nearby, a place called the Crystal Waterfall. Whatever trek you're on and whatever you feel about sites, you should go. It's more than just something to look at. Here. He grabs a bit of paper and scribbles down a note. Hand this to the idiot who collects the toll and he'll let you pass. Okay. What's so special about the waterfall? I won't tell you. That way you'll go just to find out. You nod once. And once you leave, where to next? I would say to Car. Car! Now there's a town. Listen, let me give you some more advice. You're full of advice. Okay, go ahead. I have some powerful friends, you see. He says, and his tone might be slightly threatening. There's a man I know, and he's quite an important man, too. Name is Vic. If you get into trouble, just remember that. Even a name can be a thing of power sometimes. Same as how you found me. This is bound to be useful later. Advice Andy. Who is he? A man of power and influence. A politician, you might say. Yeah, anyways, you'll find out, no doubt. He takes to wiping down the bar again. So you'll be heading through Torapani. It's a Sfin village. No humans there at all. The chief will probably try to persuade you to help his daughter. She's been carried off by marauders. Vic for first noble, yep. You guys remember. Some of you do. Of course I'll help or it's not my trouble. Uh, of course I'll help, right? Good, I'm glad to hear it. Poor girl. She's been left as a sacrifice in a dark cave guarded by a deadly manticore. If you've not met one before, well, watch your back and your front. And if you know a spell or two, then all to the good. The beer is done. You stand to go, nod to Glandragor, and head out into the street. Jan flits quickly long behind you. Or along behind you, right? 
You head up a path that climbs through a crack in the mountainside. Soon the air is filled by a thundering. It's quite a climb, but eventually you turn a corner through a narrow cleft in the rock and see close up the waterfall you glimpsed from the hilltop earlier today, plunging down from the cliffs overhead. Large crystal stalactites hang down either side of the water. There's only one path to reach it, winding up the rock face, and it passes by a small hut where a ruffian is collecting money. You make your way over to the hut. Greetings, you begin. You collect a fee for the waters? <clears throat> These waters cannot be so healing that he has... <clears throat> Whoops. I do, sneezes the ruffian. These waters cannot be so healing that he has not caught an awful flu from them. Three gold pieces. You hand the scrawled note over to the ruffian. He probably can't read, but he seems to recognize the penmanship as he nods furiously twice and then stands aside to let you pass. The ruffian hands you a towel. You head up the waterfall, which cascades forcefully into a deep pool. You strip off your clothes and dive into the pool, while Jan flitters through the froth. The cool water is fresh and invigorating, and you feel yourself getting rapidly better. You feel a huge swell of confidence. Coming here was the best decision you have made. Wait, this water cures disease. Wait. This water cures disease. Something about that seems terribly important. People should be told about that. The villagers up on their lonely mountain, ravaged by the plague, they should be brought here. They can be saved. But it is late already. The walk back to the plague village will you lose you a day, maybe more. And with this place so close, they must know of it. Perhaps their symptoms are too serious to be healed. If you send someone else, they might not do it. Shouldering your pack, you begin the long, weary walk back to the village of the plague. You're not really doing this, are you? Jan hisses in your ear. You're crazy. You ignore the small creature's complaints. After an hour, you are within sight of the rise up to the village. Jan is hopping mad. Where are you going? I thought you were on a mission. This is, you, you don't have to come, okay? You don't have to go. This is important. Sure it is. So is sleep. You say nothing but keep walking. A few minutes later, Jan pipes up again. All right, all right, all right. What is it? What? What do you want? Jan shakes his head, leaping up from your shoulder to flitter irritatingly right in front of your face. Listen, you can't go. I won't let you. Why not? Because I'll go for you. Mini mites can't catch plague, so there's no risk. And I can fly faster than you, and if I save a whole village, I'm bound to find someone who will look after me properly. He looks at you, expecting you to argue. Get two birds at one stone. You're going to kill Jan, and the village gets saved. <laughs> don't get scammed. But Okay, but if I don't see it, then it didn't happen, right? Oh, I can just go, I can go in the water. Right, right, right. But, you know, if, what, what's the old saying? If you want something done, do it yourself. Come with me. Jan shakes his head. You don't want my company. Trust me. Then he turns and with a buzzing sound, he flits away into the dark. You are alone again. The villagers should be in safe hands, but you cannot stay to receive their thanks. It is time to find somewhere to sleep. With luck, you will reach Carr tomorrow. Mm. You make your way out of the village and into a stand of tall, dry trees under the overhang of one of the cruel mountainsides. Between curling roots... You find a small place to settle down and rest. You're tired enough to feel your eyelids drooping, but you're hungry from not having eaten. See? Oh, God damn it! You pull out a quantity of your cheese and bread and eat it quickly. The night's darkness draws in around you. In the distance, you hear screams and whoops from the village that only slowly fade. You feel lonely, distance from such revelry. You rest your head onto your backpack and close your eyes. Perhaps a few hours pass when you wake suddenly, aware of a shadow moving between the tree trunks. It turns as it sniffs the air, a wolfhound. <laughs> you raise the spell and when it's ready, you take out the bamboo pipe and play a sweet and merry tune. The stupid wolfhound finds itself racing in circles and curling up into an absurd little ball. You play long enough and energetically enough that it eventually falls asleep 
upon a stone. You hurry in the other direction to find yourself a new spot to camp. Then once satisfied, you lay down again and try to sleep. Your dreams are filled with walking, with peaks and valleys and endless paths. A curious light plays across them, building walls to heights before ruining them as it moves away. And above it all, there is a warning. Beware the Black Lotus. You rise early from your spot beneath the tree. You rejoin the path on the far side of Biritanti. The sun sits on the horizon like a gleaming jewel. If all goes well, you will reach Turupani today, the last village in the Shumantanti Hills. After a short climb, the path breaks, heading uphill to the left and downhill to the right. With Torapani so close, it hardly matters which way you go, surely. You climb a rise. The way is not too steep, and as noon approaches, you have crested the ridge and are descending yet again. You're now at the highest point of the hills, where the trees are thin. The view west goes on forever, and sometimes you catch a glimpse of Kar on the northern horizon. Uh, I'm not going to eat. I only have one ration left. It's probably a bad idea. I'm going to keep going. You decide not to stop and eat, but push on. A line of trees approaches, the shadows between their trunks deep and threatening. And then you are under the canopy, and it takes your eyes a moment to adjust. You come to a dead stop. Something is moving through the trees behind you. A moment later, a point of steel has emerged from the darkness between two trees and touches your neck. You've seen me, whispers a voice. I know it. I see nothing, you call back. You're quite safe. It is not I who is not safe, returns the voice. Who is there? There's no reply, but the tall, dark figure of an assassin emerges from the trees. He is dressed head to toe in black, and you had not seen him a moment before. Even though he had been standing a mere arm's length away, he wields a sharp scimitar in expert hands. Uh, Alright, I'm going to make a shield. You lay a gold piece on your wrist and cast your spell. The gold melts into your flesh with a burning sensation and a shield blossoms into place. You bring your sword up to bear. I think he's going in uh, hard right off the bat. Let's see. Oh, bad. Very bad. The assassin nods at you, taps two fingers against his chest, and readies his stance. Yeah, yeah, my duty is to sever your head from your neck, he declares in a voice as cold and polished as marble. You will not hold me from it. Uh, I'm going full blast again. Okay, good, I got it. I caught that off guard, good. Time to attack, you rush forward with a deep, heavy slash, outclassing his own sword swing. You catch him deep in the side. Red blood soaks his black tunic. You move around him watchfully, and he hangs back and watches you in return. Breathing deeply, the assassin whispers a mantra as he readies his blade full blast. Let's go. Got him. Cast Earwig. <laughs> Fainting left, you die forward with a deep, heavy blow. He is off balance and moving slowly, and the blade goes deep. He turns and tumbles, releasing his sword as he topples. I am not so proud as to not admit when I am beaten. You may finish me if you choose so, but if you do, do me an honor and use my own blade. The assassin is not dead. He lies on the floor, gasping. Finish him and search his body, or spare him. And get up, you tell him, holding your sword back, but not putting it away yet. He nods and sheaths his own blade. You're an honorable man. I'm glad to have met you. Now you've saved me. You own me in part. My name is Flanker, and I am an assassin and a thief. Why did you attack? It's a simple matter. I picked on wayfarers for practice in hiding and in killing. I assumed you would be no match, but I see I was wrong. He bows his head once, perhaps in respect, perhaps from the pain of his injuries. You're traveling to Ka, he asks. Why do you ask? That is the way I'm going. Well, perhaps I will not see you again once we part now. But if I do remember me, I will not forget the debt I owe you. He is useless. Finish him. <laughs> it's so funny. 
He is useless. Finish him. They give you a second opportunity. You're turning into Johnny Carson. <laughs> I remember you there. He bows his head again. This time it's definitely from pain. Go. Oh, you cannot aid me. Help him. No, you reply. I have caused your wounds. I will help you. He grins with gritted teeth. Are you a doctor? I do not think you are. Kill him. <laughs> Just, yeah. They want you to kill him. So they give you so many opportunities to kill him here. It's three different times. Find his wounds. Tearing strips of dark fabric from his clothing, you bind his wounds tightly and the bleeding lessens. You are too kind to a man who is about to kill you. Let that be your lesson. You reply as you gather up your things and head out of the forest, leaving him behind. You have a sense that you've made a powerful friend. You continue along the path and around the side of a hill. A wooden hut is set into the slope, with an old woman sitting on the front step. A river seems to emerge from beneath her. As you get closer, you realize the water flows underneath her house, and the house itself is set on a splayed struts like an insect straddling the water course. A few paces from the front of the house, the water plunges over the edge of a sheer cliff and disappears. Look, another woman to kill. I didn't kill anybody. I stole stuff from somebody's house and accidentally casted a spell that like, tur like turned off their brain for a minute, okay? I didn't kill anybody. That person is not dead. I didn't kill anyone. Let's say hello. Greet the woman. Greetings, you call. The woman looks up at you and smiles. Come over here, won't you? I can barely see you. You approach the old woman. She smiles a toothless smile and gets up from the step. Come in, please, she beckons. I get so lonely living out here on my own away from the villages. Thank you. You follow her inside and take a seat by a long wooden table. I'll bring us some tea, she says. She sounds almost nervous. Hurrying to her kitchen, she returns with two large cups. Drink the tea. Make conversation. Let's make conversation. The tea is still hot. You cup it between your hands as you speak. This is a beautiful place, you remark, watching the river outside the door plunging away over the cliff face. This is the top of the crystal waterfall. The river runs right under my house. They say it carries all my goodness and youth away while I sleep, and the villagers bathe in it for luck. She giggles meanly. Oh, I'm sure it isn't quite true. Don't drink that tea. Don't drink that tea. <laughs> drink the tea? What's your name? They call me Gaza Moon, she replies with a smile. I used to be quite well known in my way. You nod, but you have never heard of her. Don't drink that tea. Why do you live alone? It must be more dangerous. Oh, <laughs> no one bothers me about me. Why would they? You can't help but notice she has not answered the question. You make to sip your tea when the old woman stops you, catching your arm before the cup reaches your lips. Oh, I've forgotten the pot. She goes back to the kitchen to fetch it. While she is away from the table, you switch the two cups around. Then when she returns, you lift the one closest to you and drink. A sudden, deep pain grips your stomach and you double over. What's happening? You wince and cough as you find yourself seizing up. Oh, suspicious stranger. <laughs> I can count on travelers suspecting my witchcraft. I'll kill you. Please release me. Please release me. You try to shout out, but you are paralyzed and quite powerless. The old woman begins to search through your bag. Then, with a coup of delight, she pulls out the spellbook page you were given by the old man in the tree. My book! She cries. The missing page! Oh, why didn't you tell me you had my missing spell? She scurries off into the kitchen and returns with a cup of liquid, which she pours into your half-open mouth while ducking and stroking your head. It is an antidote and you feel your body slowly unfreeze. Finally, she slaps you to bring you around. 
What is the spell? Who was the old man? A rogue and a bandit. Four days ago, I was visited by a traveler such as yourself. But when I was away making my tea, as I always do, he started leafing through my book and tore out a page. He must have been a wizard of power because he vanished almost too fast for me to curse him. Will you uncurse him now? Well, she looks a little uncomfortable. I rather think it might be too late. I aged him to almost 130 years, you see. I wanted to slow him down, but in sp instead I sped him up. <laughs> she fuses the with the page, repairing her spellbook with some gentle magic. You take the opportunity to leave. It is now late afternoon. You pass over the brow of the next hill, and below you is the village of Torapani, slung from one side of the valley to the next like a flood barrier. Observe. Torapani is a village of the Sfin, an aggressive-looking race of man-orcs. You might expect their village to be rowdy, but it seems strangely quiet. Go to the town. Still, there's no way around it. You will have to go through it. Into Torapani. You enter the village. There is a definite air of depression hanging over the place. The Sfins are going about their business slowly and miserably and pay no heed to you. You sit yourself down on a tree stump in the very center of the village to consider your options. There are three inns in the village, but two are closed down, their windows boarded and their thatched roofs rotting through. The third looks a little better, but at least its door... It doesn't look very good, but it's still open. And the smell of well-cooked food drifts out. From a sign by the doorway, it seems that food costs three gold pieces and a bed for the night costs five. God damn. The price isn't worth the value. You turn away intending to sleep for free under the stars instead. You walk out past the borders of Torapani and settle down under the trees. There's time to eat. I have no more food. You wolf down the last of your provisions, then rest your head and try to sleep. Perhaps you manage a minute or perhaps an hour, but suddenly you wake, certain that something in, is moving in the bushes nearby. You stay still, listening carefully, waiting for your moment. But there isn't a moment. Out of the bushes on either side, five figures leap forward, each grabbing a different part of your body. Your ankles are held, your arms too. We got him! cries a Sven voice. Then they are hauling your body out of the thicket and along the path back to the village. Where are you taking me? Wait to see. Pray to my spirit for aid. Oh, we can, we can pray to the ape. Pray to the ape. In a whisper, you begin a prayer to your spirit, the ape, for aid. Nothing happens immediately. Then you reach a low hut and are thrown to the earth. Your arms and legs are released. Perhaps your spirit has heard you. You cannot be sure. But now that you have summoned the powers above, they will not help you again. <laughs> Somebody said, uh, NFT ape? No, dude. It's the, it's the ape. It's the, oh, the, do you hear that? It's the ape. The door is slammed and locked. A moment later, it reopens and your possessions are thrown inside. Wait to see what happens. You pull your knees up to your chest and wait. The long watches of the night pass slowly and in the end, nothing happens and no one comes. Everybody has that dog. <laughs> Daybreak. You're still alone. An hour passes before you hear any noise outside, and then the door to the hut opens and five spins come in. They drag you roughly out and across the street to another hut, where an old man with gray hair sits. He's wearing outlandish, colorful robes. My name? Brosius Chief. He slaps his chest twice. I apologize. Then he bows, brushing the dust on the floor with his sleeves. Did I just brush him? Rush him. While his head is bent, you spring up and rush at him. You almost reach him too before the other spins catch you and hurl you painfully back onto the ground. The chief looks at you sternly. Brave. This is what we need. He waves to a menial who brings in bread and milk. Gratefully, you bolt down the meal. It does not seem to be poisoned, and it nourishes you. The bowl is removed and the chief squats down in a pool of cloth have need of you and your strength. I will kill you. The chief nods. No, 
I fear I kill you. My daughter, my child, she is taken, offered to a terrible demon below. You want me to rescue her? The chief nods. Succeed, and you may choose your reward. Fail, and... Yeah. Mm. Why don't you do it? Save her yourself. He gestures to the other spins, who, still taking no chances, grab you by your arms and haul you to your feet. You are led along a short pathway through the forest to a crack in the ground. One spin has brought a rope, and another a basket. They are preparing to lower you down into the pit of the earth itself. You wait until they are ready, then step into the basket. The chief nods to you with respect. Watch the darkness, he declares as they start to lower you down. You hit the floor with a thud and peer into the darkness. Your eyes can make out nothing, but a slight breeze suggests endless space in all directions. You are blind, helpless, trapped. Something clatters to your feet from above. One of the spins shouts something down to you. You crouch down and feel around your feet until your hand closes on the base of something. You pick it up. It is a dry wood torch. Something else falls from above and strikes you on the head. Tinderbox! calls the voice. Curse whoever hit you. <laughs> you hurl a curse upwards. The Sphins, despite their concern over the missing tribe member, laugh. The sound echoes like water between the walls. Feel around for the tinderbox. Rubbing the bruise on your head, you reach down and find the tinderbox, light the torch. You strike a light, and the torch blazes into flame. You can see now you are in a large cavern, wide and deep. At the far end, passageways disappear to the left and right. Though an uneven rock fall at the far end of the cavern, you hear a murmur. You clamor over the rocks at the edge of the cavern to investigate the sound. It is a whimpering coming from the other side of the pile of stones. The Spin Girl, perhaps. She came in this way, but then the cave-in blocked off her path. You'll have to find another way to reach her. You turn right, creeping forward slowly. The passage rises up a gentle incline. At the top, a thick crystal seam glitters in the torchlight, and the tunnel ends in a T-junction. Look at the crystal. I'm going to look at the crystal. The seam seems to be made of pure diamond. It was no doubt in quest of this that these tunnels were carved. But why is no one mining here now? I want it. Dig it up. You try to pry some diamonds loose from the incredible seam in the rock, but your sword is not up to the task. And you would only make it blunt. You could perhaps return with a proper pick, but only if you can escape these tunnels first. You take the right-handed tunnel. You walk down the passage for several minutes, then slip on some dirt, and the ground beneath your feet gives way. You plunge into a hidden pit and land on something soft. Lucky escape. <laughs> or maybe not. Whatever it is you've landed on is moving, and what's more, it's hissing. You are in a pit of snakes. Oh no. The ape is far from you. It's too bad we... Why did we pray? Try something else. Use magic. Pray to the spirit. The, the ape is gone. We used it because we were getting uh, captured. I could do law. Probably would work pretty well. If I had a grenade, I'd throw it. Let's do law. It's expensive, but it's worth it. You cast the spell and feel the snakes come under your command. You command the snakes to approach. They slither nearer and nearer, and then they begin to climb the walls, holding themselves erect, until they form a living ladder that stretches up the passage above. Should I test it? What if, uh, is this bad? Should I just go quick? I'm going to go quick. You steal your courage and climb quickly back up to the tunnel. Back on firm ground, you watch as the spell leaves the snakes and they tumble, snapping, hissing, and hungry back to the cavern floor. You're soon back at the crystal seam, where a side passage opens on the left. You push on. Here the cave system widens. Pendulous stalactites hang from the ceiling, as if about to fall and skewer you into place. You skirt between them, following a thin, safe path until a passageway appears on your right. You move through the opening in the right wall. After a few minutes, walk up a shallow incline. You begin to hear something in the distance. A low rumbling. 
turn and run or just wait well, let's what happens let's see let's run you turn and run but not fast enough the rumbling gets louder and louder until you look over your shoulder to see an enormous boulder rolling speedily down the tunnel towards you Fuck, the ape is not here do i have can i cast a spell you check the you check the stars to see what spells are available to you wall create an invisible wall that's a good one that's three health though i'm doing well you cast your spell just in time, and the great boulder hits your invisible wall with considerable force, causing the whole cave to shake and shudder. Then the boulder holds in place like a pawing horse. But your spell will not last long, you'd better move on. The passageway slopes down a short way, then a crack splits the wall on the left. Two stones are stacked on top of one another against the wall here. Examine the stones. There's nothing special about the two stones except that they happen to be on top of one another. You go left, then you spot, you see a spot of sunlight up ahead and rush forward to find yourself back beneath the crack in the ceiling through which you came. <laughs> climb out of the hole. I'm out of here. Get me the fuck out of this hole. Can I climb out of the hole? You set your toes into a crevice near the base of the rock wall and begin to try to climb your way out. The stone is coarse and cruel on your fingers. And soon you have cuts below your knuckles and on your knees and elbows. Halfway up, the slope of the crack <laughs> begins to curve over and the going gets more difficult. Keep going. You will not give up. You keep climbing one hand after the next, testing every foothold. After some more effort with blood trickling between your closed fingers, you are within a few reaches of the sunlight. That's when they notice what you're doing. A Sven eye appears over the lip of the crack. Then something, one end of the coiled rope is dropped straight into your face. You lose your grip and fall. Do I survive? You hit the floor with a horrible crunch. Your ankle is badly twisted and you are lucky to not have broken your neck. The rope is quickly whisked up again out of sight. <laughs> Get me out of here! You ball up to the sky. There is no reply. No rope is lowered down. You creep forwards to the dark, quite sure you are going in circles. The ground begins to slow. <laughs> oh, that's so stupid. The ground begins to slope upwards, and the walls begin to glitter as you encounter a seam of crystal. Have you been this way before? Here, the passage you are following splits. You take the left passage. The way is soon blocked by a large boulder. You turn back. You're soon back in the crystal scene where a crawl space gapes on your right. Right, gang. Soon you're back in the spot of sunlight below the opening in the ceiling. Turn around. Go straight. You move onwards along the tunnel, quite sure you're going in circles. This ground seems to dip, and its lowest point, the path you were creeping through, finishes at another fork. There's a stacked pair of stones here as well. You slip through the opening in the left wall. The tunnel twists and bends sharply, as if carved by a river now long since dried away. You lose all sense of which way is which, except to keep going forward, where the winding seam forks again. Another pair of stones are stacked in one corner. How about face cam? All right, you've been good. You've been good. We'll do it for a minute. You go left. The going is suddenly more difficult, and you realize that the tunnel is climbing at a quite a sharp gradient. Little stones, little stones rattle and roll away downwards into the dark. At the highest point, the cavern flickers in the torchlight and reaches a split. As you enter, two stones roll away down the slope. Two stones. The cave walls crush in close as though the rock is squeezing you to death. Your shoulders rub against the walls. When you feel certain you can go no further, the tunnel branches once more. Two more stones are stacked against the wall. I, got, I went left again. You squeeze into the gap in the left wall. You follow the passageway when you hear an echo of whimpering coming up the corridor. Your torchlight falls across a frail shape. Hiding in the shadows is the young Sven girl. Stacking stones into hundreds of little towers. Put the traps first. You run the torchlight around the walls of the cavern. No switches or triggers that you can see. 
The girl watches you with silent fear. And then the torchlight falls on a deep scratch in the rock, a claw mark. Suddenly, there is a loud roaring from the mouth of this short cavern. The walls begin to shake and crumble. The Sven's stone towers topple and scatter. To one side, a gap in the rubble begins to open, letting through a mean shaft of light. But before you can head for it, the roaring sound is joined by a scream from the Sven girl. You turn slowly and peer into the gloom back along the tunnel. Is there something moving? Something coming closer? Perhaps the roaring is the wind rushing through the tunnels. Something is coming. You hear the scrabbling and sound of claws on rock, and the exit from the tunnel is blocked by a dark and looming shape, a manticore, huge, terrible. It stands between you and the light, and it howls in bloody rage. I'm going to try it and rewind. I'm curious. Stop. You cast a spell, and the rock wall behind the manticore shifts and tumbles, opening a wider passage through which you see the daylight from the crack in the ceiling above. One of the tumbling rocks hits the manticore's sting, which was swinging through the air towards you. A lucky escape. What? Did I get out? Wait, draw my sword to cast another spell. Hold on. Wait, 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 wait. Can I get out? Whoa, there's new things. Hold on. Yap. Oh, I can't talk. I, I, I'm not... I can talk to the manticore? What? Yob, summon a... Oh, you shitting me? Are you shitting me? Should I summon a giant? All right, can we just see what Gob does and then rewind? Let me see. I'm curious. Let's do it. You toss down one of your goblin teeth and quickly cast the spell. With a cloud of smoke, a furious goblin warrior appears, making the Sven girl shriek with fear. But he is under your control, and you direct him straight towards the manticore. The little goblin fights valiantly, ducking nimbly between and around the swings of the gigantic stinging tail. But ultimately, he is no match for the vicious beast. One strong swoop of a claw, and his little body is broken in two. Do it again! You throw down another goblin tooth. This one fares a little better than the first. Perhaps each learns from the last. He lands a few good strikes and then is crushed beneath a gigantic paw. Then the beast is on top of you, and there is no more time for spellcasting. Oh, god damn it. They did two damage. Let's do it. You pull out your pouch of sand and quickly toss it across the floor, raising the spell. The floor begins to bubble and bend, and then suddenly where there had been solid stone, there is now a sucking grasping pool of quicksand right beneath the manticore's feet. Before it can react, its front paws are being dragged below ground. The creature beats its wings in a furious panic, and its sting lashes and bashes at the wall as it struggles and tries wildly to free itself. The sting is lancing towards you. Dodge left. You dodge left as the sting swings past you to the right. You laugh. A lucky escape indeed. The terrible tug of war continues, but the spell is beginning to wear off, and the manticore is such a large beast that the quicksand is not enough to contain it. However, it has worn itself out considerably from the struggle. The manticore roars, making the walls of the chamber shake, but listening closely, you can hear a note of fear in its too human voice. It is still a beast of ferocious strength, but you have weakened it. You'll have to make this next and final spell matter or take it to task with your sword. You cast the spell Heart in Your Mouth. This enchantment only works on unintelligent creatures. But is the manticore intelligent? Or is it a foul beast of base urges and rage? You step back, sword drawn, ready in case the spell should fail. For a moment, the manticore stops quite still. Its sting lowers to the floor. Its expression becomes one of dark confusion. The great wings flutter and flap. Shit! <laughs> oh no! Then a moment later it seems to wake once more. The great sting rises and the creature bellows a howling roar of rage and defiance. 
Those old man's eyes glower at you with the hatred of all the ages. Your spell has failed. You're out of time. You must fight the creature. Oh! <gasps> the fearsome creature paces forward, teeth barred. At the last moment, the manticore pounces all claws off the ground and bared to plunge into your flesh. It takes you by surprise and wide open, knocking you painfully back. Spin Girl screams out in alarm. The Spin Girl screams. <laughs> oh. Only then do you see the giant sting plunging down towards your forehead. In your weakened state, you are too slow to roll out of the way. The sting lands with the force of a hammer blow piercing your skull. The last thing you feel is the pumping of burning poison as it enters your brain. Ugh, should I go for it? Is it time to bring out the giant? But I want to keep the giant. What if the giant could help somewhere else? Mud was... I think mud was good. We're doing mud. Duck in the sand. It was dodge left. Swings past to the right. Okay. Let's go. It's already afraid. Pull out the six. All right, we're going to do clones. Let's do it. This is whatever happens, happens. You cast a spell, and as you lower your hand, the spin girl gasps. Three identical figures have stepped out from behind you to the left and two more to the right, each making the same magical gesture. <laughs> the manticore opens its spittle-flecked jaws and howls at all six of you. What? You, what? <laughs> you can't even see. <laughs> all six of us. <laughs> Then it pauses and sniffs the air. Of course, your clones have no scent. However, you still have six times the attack power, and the monster will be forced to move slowly to ensure it hits its target. You draw your sword and close on the beast, eyes focused tightly on the terrible sting, but at least you have caused it some injury already. All right, I have six times the attack power. Um. All right, defend. Yep, good start, good start, good start, good start. I'm all right. The fearsome creature paces forward, teeth bared. You and your clones drop back, raising your guard, hoping the beast will wear itself out. At the last moment, the manticore pounces all claws off the ground and bear to plunge into your flesh. You brace yourself as it comes down and leap aside at the last moment, claws raking your skin. For a moment, it is close enough to smell its warm, fetid breath. Okay, that was all in. We're gonna go, like, two. Fuck you! Oh my god, that's bad. What? Oh, come on, dude. Full blast. There it is, there it is. We have... Look at how much damage we're doing, and I have six times the attack power. Really? The creature snarls and snaps at jaws. You must finish this monster before it finishes you. With the rock wall at your back, you have no way to hide. But a perfect platform to spring forward, you and your clones race at the manticore, catching it a light blow. The beast growls at you. The walls shiver with its fury. The spin girl edges nearer, as if thinking of scratching the creature with her claws. It's scared, she whispers to you. You might not believe me, but you've scared it. Going again. Oh, got it. Beautiful. Standing firm, you, along with your copies, swing a mighty stroke against the monster, slipping a little strike past the manticore's outstretched claws. The creature crashes against a wall. Smash! Rock dust pours onto its back, but as it tries to shake itself, it stumbles. You can hardly dare to hope the foul beast is weakening. All right, I gotta be careful. You can almost smell the creature growing in rage and drop quickly away. The manticore makes a nasty swipe with its fearsome claws, but you and your clones duck and escape real injury. You are gasping for breath. The creature's relentless assault, its sheer rage is almost too much for you to take. The manticore chomps and grinds its teeth, its expression an ugly frown. All in. Good. That's another three. I'm going all in again. In the darkness of the cave, it's hard to read the monster's intentions, but you cannot wait forever. Dropping your weight, you and your copies chop a heavy swing at the vile beast, catching the manticore a passing cut again. Right? I think so, right? Because he's used his whole bar. I'm going in again. I'm gonna am I gonna die? I have to do it. I have to. I'm dead. <laughs> Wait, you've scared it, right? It's scared. You might not believe me, but you've scared it. 
I don't. I think it's gonna come in with like a one or a two. I don't know. Defend, defend, defend. Don't believe, don't believe. Isn't it gonna be t a little bit? I fucking told you guys! I told you! I told you! Now I have to defend again. Okay? Now we go in at like a five or a six. Six, just to be sure. Yep. All right, I gotta do one more all in. Grinds its teeth, expression, ugly frown. Does it have enough to do like six or seven? God fucking damn it. No! <laughs> I'm so dead again. The monster rears up and in its back legs, it fills the room. I'm dead. Oh! The manticore screams and howls in a voice that is almost human. It is dying. Slowly, furiously, but nonetheless, it weakens. I have to go in. It's... You fucked me up. You guys 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 fucked me up. Okay. When she says it's scared, I'm going in. You've scared it. Again. <laughs> Alright. Now we defend. Yep. We're gonna make it out. This is it. This is it right here. All in. Alright. Literally have to hit it one more time. But I'm gonna defend. Should I? Yep. Good call. Now we go all in. See you later. Goodbye. See you later. The manticore laughs at you with a human expression of twisted joy. You risk an attack of racing across the stone, you and your five copies. <laughs> they didn't even... They didn't do anything. Would I have done one damage? <laughs> your sword blade seems almost to be possessed. It finds its way past the manticore's sweeping claws, through its thick hide, and down into its ancient, cruel heart. For a moment, it howls loud enough to make the walls shake, and then everything falls very quiet. I'm almost dead. The only noise in the chamber is the hammering of your heart, and the quiet breathing of the Svin girl. Thank you, the Svin girl murmurs, then tugging at your arm. This way! She leads you towards the light, through the gap made by your dop spell to the pool of sunlight in the first cavern. Oh, that's good. You wave the torch, hoping to attract attention. Tell the girl to call up. Girl, call to your father. The Sfin child nods mutely, then bawls at the top of her lungs. Roseus, I'm here! Then something drops down, a rope with a basket on the end. The girl first! Calls a voice from above. Proceus. No, I come up first. <laughs> no, I come up first. You call back, stepping into the basket. The rope doesn't move. The girl. The girl comes first. <laughs> I ain't moving. No. You call back quite calmly. Once I'm up, there's nothing to stop you rescuing her. If we're both to be rescued, you'll have to rescue me first. A minute passes. Presumably the spins are talking it through. The girl is looking at you, eyes wide with fear. <laughs> Recycled joke, Andy. Come on, it's funny. <laughs> All right, swap places with the girl. Her filmed eyes reflect the ordeal she has been through, alone down here for so long. And your cold heart melts. Don't let them leave me, you whisper to her as you step out of the basket and lift her in. I won't, she promises. You cup your mouth and shout upwards. Haul away! The spins give a great cry and begin to pull, and the basket starts to slowly rise, spinning as it goes. The girl waves to you as she disappears up into the sunlight, and she is gone. Wait. A minute passes. Nothing. Wait. Another minute. Still nothing. 
no sign of sound or movement from above, that treacherous cur Proceus has betrayed you clearly. The tunnel echoes very slightly. A noise from the depths. Perhaps the manticore was not alone. Someone just said, you stupid bastard. You wait a little longer, settling down on your pack. You can imagine the celebration going on above ground. The tears and grateful reunion. No surprise if they lose track of you down here in the dark. And then, sure enough, the basket and the rope tumble down. You clamor quickly in and they haul you up. Above ground, the chief himself helps you out onto the grass. His daughter is with him, clutching his hand. My daughter tells you fought bravely. For that, I grateful. I invite you with us. Back, Torapani. Will you come? Carry on to Car or back to Torapani. Go back and kill them. After all this shit you did. <laughs> Back to town. Go back, 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 back. All right, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll go back, I'll go back, I'll go back, I'll go back. A little generosity cannot hurt you. You nod, I will come. As you enter the village, it erupts into celebration. You're given a place to stay and recuperate from your long journey. A visit to the healing priest treats your wounds. And when you emerge, it is to find the village before so somber and silent. Now in full life. Flowers are tied to every rooftop and bands of spins are playing music on long, strangely shaped lyres. You are whisked away into the dance by Proceus' daughter before the chief can give you his thanks again. The night is glorious. That night you sleep heavily and rise the next morning to continue your journey. The chief meets you before you go. You are rude, he declares. But we Svins pay our debts. He presses two gifts into your hands. A pouch of ten gold pieces. A fortune for a place like this. And a key. This open the South City Gate of Car. I hope it use. I hope it is use. <laughs> Time to go. You take your leave. The path winds away from Torapani. And soon you are on a downward slope away from the Shumatanti Hills, through stepped rice fields. As you walk, you feel for the first time the loneliness of the path ahead. Though Car is a busy city, it is cruel. And beyond Car, there is nothing but the vicious wasteland. You'll have no time and no one to trust in the days ahead. Wait, what? For a brief moment up on the hills above the path, you fancy you see a figure stealing its way along by some high and secret route. A figure in all black. But when you shade your eyes against the sun, whatever was there has disappeared. In the distance rises the wall of a great city. The first true stonework you have seen since you left home. Your journey through the Shumantanti Hills is completed. Along the way, you have gained the friendship of Vic, an influential man in the city, and Flanker the Assassin and have been given the key to the gates of Car. You've collected a fantastic number of magical artifacts. A large lump of beeswax, a cloth skullcap, one giant's tooth, twelve goblins' teeth, and a bamboo pipe. You are still armed only with your original sword, and have no rations and seventeen pieces of gold, and a spell book. The adventure continues in Sorcery 2. Ah, city port of traps. The crown of kings has been stolen by the Archmage and taken across the backlands to Manpang. You've been sent to get it back. But you fail. The whole of Kakabad will surely fall. Journey began. From the outpost settlement in Annaland, you crossed the Shumantanti Hills. Along the way, you spared the life of a defeated assassin, saved a village from the plague, and fought and killed the dreaded Manticore. You faced starvation and disease test of character. To survive, you used your blade rarely and your intelligence frequently. You deceived, charmed, and tricked your way through. Your spirit guide changed as you changed, becoming the ape. Now all of that seems a distant memory. 
when you are approaching Kari, the city port of traps. And look at how huge this fucking map is. Founded on a ford of the Jabaji River. Kare was once a camp for the pirates who ambushed merchants sailing from Lake Lumli to the sea. But the camp grew, it became a village. The village became a town. And now Kare is a magnet for ne'er-do-wells and thieves, ruled over by a council of villains. It cannot be avoided. Let the city do its worst. It is a place of treachery and traps. You will have to be constantly on your guard. As you cross, your goal is the North Gate, the only entrance to the Backlands, and the next stage of your journey. Your quest is to succeed. You must enter the city port of traps and make it out alive. Ladies and gentlemen, Inkle presents... Steve Jackson's Slaughtery! Part two, Kare, the city port of traps.